everyone, my name's Amy and welcome. Today we're going to be talking about my targeted approach to spelling. So I really hope you enjoy today's session and get a lot out of it. It really isn't an all or nothing approach. You know, if you don't want to do the whole program because maybe your whole school is doing their own program where you have to do certain things within your spelling, uh, this is still going to be a great video for you to watch because there are definitely elements that you can take out and adopt in your classroom. I hope you enjoy it and let's get to it. I'm estimating today's session will take about 45 minutes and if you check out the description box below you should be able to find a link to an attendance certificate that you can put in your teacher portfolio. Here's an overview of what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to start off with what is spelling and what am I incorporating within my spelling program. What word list do I decide to use? I'm going to talk about my daily spelling routine including giving you guys some activities that you can take back and do in your classroom. We're going to be talking about testing to make sure this is really having an effect on your students and that they're learning these words. We're going to be talking about how we can help our weaker and stronger students. And then I'm going to show you some resources at the end that you might like to use in your classroom. Let's start off by defining exactly what spelling is and exactly what I am covering in my spelling program. Because I feel like there's two separate camps when it comes to spelling. Either you're doing something that's phonics based or you are doing the rote memorization of a specific list of words. So this is my timetable for my class this year and you'll see that I do spelling every single day of the week and it goes for about 15 minutes a day. Now spelling comes second for me after literacy rotations because these are two very structured things, very routine things that don't take much organization to get ready that I can do every morning that really maximizes that first part of the day. The kids can come in, they know exactly what they're doing and they just get into it. It's also really good for those kids who get a bit anxious because they know every morning exactly what they're going to be doing. So it's a great way to start your day with a really positive start. The spelling session that I am doing on a daily basis is about the memorization of a specific word list. But I do really feel like uh, learning phonics and learning about sounds and how they work together is a very important part of spelling. I just don't do it as part of my spelling program. So there are three other places that I feel like spelling really comes up on my timetable. The first one is anytime we do writing and the main one there is when we are editing our work and going through and identifying any words that we spelt wrong and underlining it. That is very beneficial for the kids. I also do it during my grammar and punctuation lessons every now and again. So for example, the other day I did tenses with my kids and you're going to be covering spelling there by looking at the adding ed rules or the adding ing rules. I also have a designated word study time each week. This is kind of like euphonics, but I don't like to call it phonics. Uh, so this is where we're looking at particular sound groups. So maybe we're looking at diagraphs one week, or we might be looking at uh, double letters or silent letters. Uh, with my year four fives at the moment, we're going to start looking at Greek and Latin origins. So these lessons go for about 15 to 45 minutes. They can be a lessons where we're brainstorming words that have that spelling pattern. They could be getting up and moving around and doing actions for something. It could be making a crafty activity that's to do with that sound. I really try to stay away from worksheets for phonics because I think that it doesn't work. Uh, when we're asking kids to write a certain sound over and over again, I don't think that's an effective way of really getting it into their head. I really love oral language activities for word study. So if you're familiar with my work, you've probably seen my term planners before. So obviously I do one of these up for every single term and I'll have a column that is for my language, which is my grammar and punctuation, and I'll have a column for word study. And I'll just pick out each week exactly what I'm going to be doing. Uh, part of this comes from the Australian curriculum, other parts of it just come from knowing what my students need to learn at different times. Uh, I actually have these up for free. Uh, if you sign up to my newsletter, you can get these uh, for free for years one to year six. So I'll try and put the link for that down below as well if you're interested in getting a copy. I feel like uh, in the last few years, you really can't say spelling without mentioning words their way. If you have managed somehow to stay underneath a rock and not know what words their way is, it is a special spelling program that was developed by Pearson's and it's all about word sorts. So, for example, one of the ones that my kids were doing the other day was one where it had s, h, and sh as three separate uh, headings. And then the kids had pictures of words starting with those different letters and they had to try and sort under the right heading. I have other students who are looking at uh, oo and oot words and sorting out the difference between them. 
uh, there are kids in my classroom who are doing uh, identifying Latin origins or Greek origins with a word and sorting them out. So it covers a really big scope. I think there are like four or five books to the set. And my school adopted this a couple of years ago and they wanted everybody to really go full hog, do words their way as the only spelling program within the school. And so I am a big believer in whole school programs. So I did try my best to incorporate this into my classroom, but I didn't let my own spelling program go for a second because I still felt like my spelling program was very valu valuable. So what I did with Words Their Way was I really needed to make it work for me. And a lot of the time that you spend on Words Their Way is giving the kids the sorts to cut up. So they literally spend most of their time just cutting up pieces of paper. And this just wasn't time efficient for me. My kids didn't need extra practice cutting and I didn't need the litter on the floor. So what I did was I took each of the different levels that Words Their Way has and I uh, copied it on two different colored paper and then I cut up the sorts for the kids and then I would give them out to the kids. They would use that sort each day to do the different activities that Words Their Way recommends that you do. It's mainly starting off with a sort and then doing other things like finding the words in magazines, copying them into their books, different things like that. Um, but what I found was that my kids weren't really getting much out of it. It was just really, really boring. So at the end of the year, when we got a new principal and Words Their Way went out the window, I was like, yeah, I don't want to use Words Their Way anymore. But I had all these resources for it. And I could see the value in them doing the sorts. I just didn't like the way the program was structured. So what I started doing was just doing them once a week. And I do it within my reading uh, literacy rotations. So this is my timetable up here for my literacy rotations. I see one group each day, so we don't do a full rotation every single day. Uh, it rotates through the week. And one of these groups that's working on their own will be working on Words Their Way. So I do the diagnostic test, which helps you decide which group, um, which level, sorry, the kids are gonna be on. And then the kids will come up, they'll grab their sort that they need to do, they'll sort it out of their desk, then they'll copy it into their exercise books. And then the last thing that they will do is um, uh, do a pick collage of their words or a different activity. And what I found looking back at when I used to do words their way every single day of the week versus doing it once a week, my kids are making the same gains. Uh, when I do the assessment and see how they're progressing, there was no difference between doing it once a week as there was doing it five days a week. So that's what really works for me and words their way and that's how I use it within my classroom. This is the part of Words Their Way that I really, really love. This is their assessment sheet. And what it does is gives the kids a spelling test, but then instead of just marking whether the kids got the word right or wrong, it analyzes the word and says, okay, did they get the initial sound? Did they get the final sound? Did they get the short vowels, long vowels? Did they get the digraphs? Did they get um, other um, parts of words? And so it really breaks it up nicely so you can see where your kids are at and you can see what extra intervention they need at any of these uh, levels. And so within Words Their Way, you're meant to use this to show where they start making mistakes and what level they're going to be on. I have every single student in my class on their own Words Their Way level, and you'll see that I do that with my spelling program as well, because that's what's gonna make the biggest difference to your students is having them right in that zone of proximal development, which is gonna make the biggest difference for them. Let's now move on to looking at how I choose the word list for my own spelling program. I feel like in recent years, a lot of teachers have gone back to the phonics based word list. So that's where you'll have a word list that will all have a sound in common. So the example here is shop, ship, shut, shell. They all have the sh sound. The pros of doing it this way is that they hopefully learn that sound. The cons are that these kind of lists get boring very, very quickly. The kids do it once and then they feel like they know all the words on their list because they follow such a predictable pattern. And I also feel like these kind of words are very limited in the amount that you can learn within a year. Do kids really know how to need to know how to spell all the sh words? And there's some other sounds that start to get a bit ridiculous with, you know, the kids just aren't going to use them very often. Not to mention the fact that they miss out on some words that don't fit conventional spelling patterns. The other one that I feel like was really in trend back when I was in primary school was allowing the kids to pick their own words. So this might come from words that they spelt wrong in their daily writing, or it might come from words that they're interested in. So this can have the pros of the fact that the words can be relevant because if they're using them in their diary, they're probably going, sorry, if they're using them in their writing, these are probably going to be words that they use a lot, or it's going to be of high interest to them. So it's really going to motivate them to want to do spelling because it's around a topic that they really like. 
However, the cons of this may be that they're not actually frequently used words. So if we're talking about a diary that a student's written and they went down to some random country town that has a really, really complex name and they didn't spell that right, is that really something they should have in a spelling? Uh, if they're doing words of interest, so they pick some dinosaur words, do kids really know, need to know how to spell Tyrannosaurus over a more common word? Uh, this is also um, where they've seen the word wrong already. You know, if they're getting it out of their books and they're writing it somewhere, they've already spelt that word wrong. They've already got that spelling stuck in their head. And we as teachers know that it is so hard to reteach students something if they've learned it wrong. It's so much easier to just teach it fresh. Uh, it's also difficult to assess long term because every single kid's going to be on a different list. They're going to have different words. How do you assess later on whether the kids have actually learnt those words and whether your spelling has been of any benefit to them? Another con that I forgot to put up here is just thinking about the amount of prep time that the um, teachers are spending getting these kids to do their own words. So you've got to go through the writing and um, make sure you're always marking it to identify their wrong words and then you need to check their list when they're when they're pulling it out and writing into whatever spelling book you use you need to make sure that they're transferring the correct spelling so the word list that i choose to use are high frequency word lists so you've got things like fry dolch uh, Oxford, all of those are the most used words in the English language. Uh, the particular list that I use, I'm sorry I don't actually know the name of it, it was given to me a long time ago, but it, the word list that I choose to use uh, is 1,200 words that make up 89% uh, of all written language. So some studies were done to actually pull out words that were used in different texts and which ones were coming up the most frequent. So the pros for this is it links well in with reading or sight words. You really, really want your kids to be able to read the words that they're learning how to spell. And generally, I find that if you're doing words that are similar to your sight words, the kids are going to be about one or two steps at least ahead of where they're spelling in their reading ability. Uh, it's also very relevant and necessary. If these are the words that make up 89% of all written language and you can ace all of those words before you leave primary school, then you're on to a really, really good footing. You've really got a good baseline there. This is also showing my bias because I couldn't think of any cons to put up there. You could argue that these aren't going to be of words of interest, but as I take you into my spelling approach, you'll see that my kids are really, really into the way that I do spelling. So the words that they're spelling don't really matter at this point. So like I said, the word list that I choose to use is high frequency words that make up 89% of written language. And what I did was with these words, because they're ordered from the most used to the least used of those 1,200, uh, they weren't arranged according to difficulty. Uh, the most used word in the English language, according to this study, was the. And the is not the easiest word to spell uh, compared to things like it, at, on. So what I did was around every 50 words, I started ordering them from easiest to hardest. And so my list is... Um, not exactly in the order that it originally was. I've changed it around so that the kids can come in on list one and feel like they can really achieve because the easiest words are there. But you'll also notice if you've ever seen my list uh, word list before, when you get up around list 50, all of a sudden it becomes very easy again with like three letter words. And the reason for that is because I've ordered about every 50 words into um, easiest to hardest to spell. Once you've worked out what word list you're going to use, the next consideration is how are you going to give these word lists out to your students? Are you going to have one list for your whole class? Are you going to have groups of students on the same list? Or are you going to have every single student on their own individual list? Now, I feel like with the whole class, if you're giving out one list to your whole class, and I'm sorry I've offended somebody here, but you are not catering for diversity. You are not catering for those weaker students. You are not catering for those uh, more able students. Even if you're giving a word list out that has a couple of easy words on it and a couple of hard words and a couple of medium words, you are still doing a big injustice to your students. Those weaker students are going to feel like they are so uh, far behind the rest of their class and that they're not up to uh, par and that they're just not capable of doing very much. Your higher students are going to feel unchallenged and a whole heap of kids are just going to be bored in your class. So the next approach you can choose is groups which works well for teachers who really want to have their spelling uh, time where they can do a lot of oral language based things. So you can bring your group up to you and really work through those words together. But for me personally, I really like individual lists. 
I like every single student on the exact level that they need to be at that precise point in their zone of proximal development where it's going to make the biggest difference. So I want my weaker students on easier lists and I want my more capable students on harder lists and I want everyone in between exactly where they need to be. The last thing you need to decide is how many words you're going to give your students. I personally feel like five is far too little. I don't think you're going to be getting much out of the daily spelling routine if they're only learning five words. Uh, then you've got the opportunity to have 20. I feel like that's too many. If I rattled off 20 random words to you right now, I don't think you would be able to tell me most of them back. But if I was to give you 10 and ask you to recall them, you would have a much better chance and probably get 100%. And so I feel like 10 is the right amount of spelling words to expect students to learn at any given time. Some teachers will argue that doing 20 words a week will allow you, your students to uh, learn 800 words compared with only 400 words if you're doing 10 words. Uh, but as I take you through how I do my spelling approach, you'll see that 10 works out really, really nicely. So to recap, I use a bunch of words that make up the 89% of all written language. So they are the most frequently used words. And then I've taken them and I've split them up into lists of 10 words each. So my uh, spelling word list has 1,200 words on it. So I have 120 lists. So the next thing that I have to do with my students is a pretest. I have to work out where in those spelling lists are they going to start. And I do not recommend starting everybody at the same level because again, it's not catering for diversity. You need to find out exactly where your students need to be. How I do this is I take the hardest word from every single list and I test the kids on it. They either do this on a piece of paper or an exercise book and I set them up with clipboards between them and I read out the words one at a time and as they start to make mistakes I just go around and I close up their books and say you're, you're done for now. And so for my younger students, my like year ones to three, I'm going to be taking their first mistake and that's going to be the list that they're going to start on. So if we're looking at the words here, if they made a mistake on my, they spelt it M-I, then list nine would be where those kids start. With my older students, like year fours, I don't find that's a very good approach because sometimes they might get a word earlier on wrong, like they on list 11, but then their next mistake isn't until list 57 if you were to let them continue on. And so what I find best is to find clusters of mistakes. So it doesn't have to be three in a row, but it's around the time when they start to make like every second or third word is wrong. That's going to be the area where I'm going to start them on their lists. Now that I know exactly which list my kids need to be on, I can show you the daily routine that I use with them. So I'm sure you are familiar with good old look, cover, write, check. I think we all did that at, in primary school. There's been a couple of extra steps added since then. So I'll go through this poster with you in a second. But this is the starting point for every single spelling session that we do. The kids know that they need to do look, cover, write, check. So when we say look, we're not just looking at the word to identify what it is so we can write it down. We're actually talking about looking carefully at the word and going, is it a long word? Is it a short word? Does it have double letters? Does it have a special spelling pattern in it? Does it have a hard or a tricky bit? Does it have a bit that doesn't sound like what it should? So you're really looking at the word and analyzing it. The next step is to say it. And it doesn't have to be out loud. They can just mouth it. But this step is about making sure that they actually know what the word says. Uh, if you don't check this step with your students, some of your weak ones, are going to be learning how to spell words that they have no idea what it actually says. So uh, make sure you're checking this step with your weaker students when you can. And then you've got to cover it. So somehow you need to cover up those words so you can't see them. Uh, the good old technique is like using your hand or a ruler, but uh, in a minute I'll show you the way that I do it to make sure that my kids can't cheat. Then you need to picture it. So ask them to close their eyes and picture the word that they're about to write. Uh, with younger kids, a way that you can do this is to ask them to picture it in a font. Uh, if you ask your guys to, to think of the font that McDonald's uses or the Jurassic Park movie font, the kids can picture that. And so allowing them to picture their word in that font is a great way to make it a little bit more interesting. Then you need to get them to write it down. And lastly is the checking bit. And this is where most kids fall through the cracks. If you've got kids who aren't learning their words each week, it's because they're not checking it. And with little kids, what I'll actually get them to do is tick it each letter to make sure that they've got each letter um, correctly written. Uh, with older kids, uh, it can be a little bit harder with them. Uh, but really, this is the most important step, I feel, of look, cover, write, check. 
What I use for Look, Cover, Write, Check is just a laminated card with all of the words for that list written on it in nice, clear, easy to read handwriting. And the kids can go and get one of these with whatever list they are on and they can use it for Look, Cover, Write, Check. They can refer to it when they're doing activities that I'll show you later on. And I have about five copies of every single list and that usually works out pretty good. It's not often that they'll have more than five kids on a single list. But if I do, what I um, get the kids to do is those that miss out on the Look, Cover, Write, Check sheets will go and get a master copy of all the spelling lists and they will use that to do Look, Cover, Write, Check in their book and then they will use that to do their activities. But five seems to be a really good number. You could always print off more and laminate more if you want, but I think five is a, is a good number to have. Okay, so let me show you these cards up close. They are the size of a quarter of a piece of paper, so I print four to a page. And then on the back, you can either print lines or rule lines so that the kids are going to have enough room to write all 10 words. And then all they simply do is look at the first word, turn it over and write it down and then check it. Boom. So there's no way they can cheat during that. Even if they turn it over to look at each individual letter, it's still going to be better for them than just a straight copy off of something that they can see next to them. So they go down, they do all 10, and then I love magic erasers. Magic erasers are a white type sponge that you can get from places like Big W or Coles. Uh, my favorite place to buy them is online. You just go to eBay and write magic sponges bulk and you can get like a hundred of them for $5. They are ridiculously cheap. They work so well on laminated surfaces and just clean it off so, so easily. So these are my look, cover, write, check cards. And what I'll do with these cards is uh, down the back, I have a set of drawers and the drawers are labeled like list one to 10, 11 to 20, and the kids can go in there and get out their cards each session. Or with the older kids, what I like to do is they actually keep these in their books and they go and get them uh, new ones each time they pass a list. This is a small uh, copy of one of my timetables for the week and you'll see that next to spelling I write that I do look cover uh, visualize write check visualize is just another word for picture and I put that there so that people know that we're doing that first and then I always have a designated spelling activity that we're going to do after look cover write check. To make spelling time really easy, what I decided to do was to take all the spelling activities I could think of and put them into a PowerPoint that I could easily put up onto an interactive whiteboard or onto a TV screen in my classroom. And I wanted this because I wanted the kids to be able to look up at the board anytime that they would forget what activity we were doing that day or if they needed a bit of a prompt or a heading or something like that, they could just look it up on the screen and not have to come and bug me about it. So within this PowerPoint, to really make sure that it was working well for me, I grouped all of the spelling activities. So I grouped them into quick and easy, literacy based, numeracy based, ones that require material, roll and write ones which need dices, uh, iPad or computer based ones, and games that involve more than one person. So this way I'm really easily able to pick an activity each day that's going to fit the time requirement and what we are doing. So here's one of my favorites, this is wood words and basically they have to make every single letter out of wooden planks that are straight, so no curves. And wherever the planks join together, they just use a little dot to make it look like a nail. Train words is another really, really cute one. So the kids draw the train and then each carriage is a different word. Now what I'm doing with these spelling activities most of the time is getting kids to write them into an exercise book. And I try really, really hard to fit all the activities from that one week onto one page. It doesn't always work out that way, but just trying to maximize space within their books and to, to save on paper. So with train words, you're probably not gonna be able to fit it across one row of a book. Uh, you probably have to draw two rows and put it onto a new line. Here's one of the literacy based ones. This is asking them to group the words according to their parts of speech. So nouns, verbs, adjectives, and then I've just got others. That way I can use this for grade ones because I know that they'll be pretty good with identifying those, but they might not know the other parts of speech like um, pronouns and things like that. Silly sentences is a really funny one. So you just get them to write a nonsense sentence that doesn't make a lot of sense. This is one that they really like to share to the rest of the class after they've done it uh, because it can be quite funny.
Here's one of the mass based ones. So they have to use a ruler to rule up a five by five centimeter square, and then they have to try and squeeze all their words inside of it. And you can challenge them to get smaller than that. So once they've done the five by five, uh, try four by four and then three by three and see how small they can write. But the words still have to be read and are easily identified by a partner. With all these spelling activities, I'm always trying to get them to write the words down first. So if the activity doesn't actually involve them writing down the word, they still have to write down the word. So there's tallying vowels. One, what I'd get them to do is rule up the table first and then write one of their words down and then go over to the tally and do the vowels or consonants and then write the next word. They can't just go off of their spelling list. Paint print can be a really fun one. It can be quite messy, but if you've got the time for it, you put a little bit of paint on their desks and they use their finger to write the word, which wipes away the paint. And then you go and get another piece of paper and put it over the top uh, to make a print. And if you're careful, you can actually fit all 10 words onto a piece of paper. Rainbow sand is a really fun one. It's where you get a piece of uh, colorful paper. So it might be wrapping paper or contact or something like that. And you put it on the bottom of something like a meat tray, if you're still allowed to use meat trays in your school. Or I've seen people use uh, disposable nappy wipe uh, containers, so portable ones uh, that open and have a flap. And so you put that on the bottom and then you sprinkle sand over the top and then you use your finger or a paintbrush or something to write the word in and that reveals the paper underneath. This is one of the roll and write. So you use a dice and you roll it to see how you're going to write different parts of your word or letters. So in this case, they are rolling for every letter to see what color they're gonna write it in. Tic-tac-toe is a really fun one. Uh, the kids pick the hardest word from their list or the one that they're having the most trouble with and they use that instead of noughts and crosses to play tic-tac-toe. Uh, and it's really, really good because they're focusing so much on the spelling sometimes that they forget about strategies and the game actually um, makes it a little bit harder than, than what it can sometimes be for all the kids. Uh, I don't personally use these in my classroom, but you can also laminate performers or templates for the kids and uh, give out one of those each week for the kids to write on. Uh, maybe they go up and they choose from a selection that you have and they pick one out and go and do that at their desk with a whiteboard marker if you've laminated them, or you could put it into a, uh, a sheet protector and get them to write over the top of that. So this one to the left here is texting. So if you remember the old mobile phones, where you had to press multiple buttons multiple times to get specific letters, like you'd have to press the number two twice to get a B. So the kids actually use that to write the code that they would write their um, words in. And uh, backwards words, I put that there because I want the kids always to write the words the right way before I ask them to write it backwards or jumble it around. So just to recap, on a daily basis, my students are doing look, cover, write, check, and then a designated spelling activity. Now, if they're from year one to about year three, if they get that activity finished within the time frame of the lesson, then I usually just let them have free time. Uh, it's just something nice to, uh, to strive to, to make sure they really do uh, get the activity finished nice and quick, and you can finish spelling within 15 minutes. With older kids, because they're much uh, quicker at doing the spelling activities, what I do is I put one of these spelling grids up on a wall somewhere on a, as an A3 copy. And after they finish the designated one for that day, they have to come to the spelling grid and pick one. And I have said to them that within each week, if they do get every single activity on the spelling grid finished, then they can go to free time after spelling after they've done their designated activity. Uh, but most kids don't seem to get through this in a whole week. Uh, I also use these spelling grids to send home as homework if I'm required at any time to send home homework. I personally feel like when the kids are at home, they should just be resting up and uh, learning other things that aren't um, school based. And so if a parent comes up to me and says, you know, I really want my kid to do homework, then the spelling grid is something I can send home. If it's school mandated that I have to send, send home homework, then I'll send home the spelling grids. Or if I feel like a kid isn't achieving very well in spelling, then I might recommend this to the parents. So I feel like in most classrooms, what I see is that the teachers give a word list out, the kids have four days to learn it, and then on Friday they have a test. Now that doesn't float well in my boat. I feel like some kids can learn much faster than that, some kids need more time. And then what happens if they don't pass? You know, do they get stuck on that list for a whole nother week? Or do they just move on and there's no consequences or follow up for not having retained all of those words? So what I like to do is I give my kids the chance to tell me when they're ready for a test. And that can be any day of the week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. If they are ready for a test, they nominate to have a test and then I will try and give them a test. 
Now, if they are a year one to three student, I use the approach on the left, which is basically this display that I have up on the wall. And I apologize for not having a picture of this uh, for you, but I have pegs with all the kids' names on it. And all those pegs are down the left-hand side of this display. And when the kids are ready to have a test, they move their peg over to the right side. Now, if they are lucky enough to get one of those black spots, that means they will have a test in the next filling session. If there's none of those black spots left, then they will just put their name underneath like a waiting list. So I only test six kids a day uh, in years one to three because I don't think that I can handle more kids than that. So they sit down at like my U-shaped table or a teacher's desk or something like that. Uh, if they need to, they might have display folders up between them so they can't cheat. A lot of the time they're on all different lists anyway, so it's not really applicable, uh, but I'll test them. With older kids, I feel like uh, six isn't enough. You're not going to get through your kids quick enough because often older students have a bigger class. So over here in WA, you can have up to 24 years one to three, uh, but with year four upwards, you can have 32 kids in your class. So getting through six a day isn't going to be um, getting you anywhere fast. So what I do is I have this table up on my board and the kids just write their name uh, under whichever heading they are in, and then they put their spelling list next to it and I'll go up and I'll copy their names down and I will test as many kids that day as that want to test. So sometimes that does mean you're testing 20, 25 kids a day. It doesn't happen very often that you're testing that many and a lot of them will be on very similar tests like on the same list. So you actually only end up teaching, uh, testing maybe 15 different lists. That's still 150 words. That's still a lot of words to test, but I feel like it's, it's only a couple of minutes just to do the test quickly and um, the kids are really going to benefit from it. So I can I can do that for them. So I have a master copy of um, all the spelling words. And what I do is I just circle the list that a kid wants to be tested on and I just write their name above it. I find that names work better than calling out like list 15, your word is. I feel like it, it triggers their um, listening skills a bit more, especially if you're testing the whole class. You really want to make sure that no kids are missing their words. So calling out their name is the best strategy. So what this will sound like is I say, Bianca, your first word is lady. The lady walked down the street. Bob and Mary, your first word is give. I give you permission to do this. And you can see that's actually quite fast and you can actually get through words quite quickly. So I just do one word per student and then I go back and I do the second word per students. I often also test them from the bottom up. Uh, some kids have it where they can memorize a list and spell it in the order that they've been doing it in every day. But the minute you spin that around and you test them out of order, it, it, it just, I don't, it takes up a notch and it tricks some of the kids uh, who haven't really learnt those words properly. So that's an extra little tidbit is to test them out of order and I just go bottom to top. I also have the rule that kids can't take a test the day after they've passed. I like them to really at least have one good focus lesson on that list and it also makes sure that you're not testing too much of the class in one day. So it breaks them up almost into two cohorts. Uh, then I also have rewards. So every time they pass a list, they get something small. It might be a class token, or um, in my class uh, last term, I was doing snakes and ladders as my reward chart. So it was a hundred grid. They get to go and roll the dice when they've done something good and they get to move up the snakes and ladders chart. And when they get to the top, they get into my reward box. So in this case, giving them a dice roll each time they passed a test was, was nothing. I also like to, for the younger kids, acknowledge every 10 lists that they have passed with a certificate. Uh, it's something really nice that they can take home and, and give to their parents. Uh, the other thing I'm doing this year, because my class is one-to-one -one iPads, when they pass a list, I get them to go back to their desk and do a pick collage of their words. So that's just a nice little app where you can decorate your words and put backgrounds in and things like that. And then I get them to send it to their parents through Seesaw. Seesaw is a great app that you can have that communicates with parents. And so it's like each child has their own online portfolio. So when they publish that a spelling list to pick collage, it's a way for their parents to know that they've passed the list. And if they want to help their kids at home with that list, they've, they've got a copy of it there at home. Uh, I also do all my tests on whiteboards. Uh, I did used to do it on scrap pieces of paper. Uh, but I found that I was quickly running out of paper and I would have to cut up good um, sheets rather than scrap paper for the kids to test on. So I really like the whiteboards because it's quick and easy and um, I'm not wasting paper. To pass a test, kids have to get 10 out of 10. There, there's no exception to that. They have to get 10 out of 10 to pass a list. So this is my recording sheet. So basically I have all the kids' names written down and whatever list they are on, I write that in the first column and then I just continue the numbers on. And each time they pass, I highlight it. 
and each week I change highlighted colours. So that makes it really quick and easy to see uh, which kids are passing in a week and which haven't. So I can go through and go, okay, no kid has purple here. So uh, sorry, this kid doesn't have purple, so that means they haven't passed a test this week. And then I can go up to them and I can go, look, I, I've noticed you haven't had a test this week. I would really like you to have one and just kind of give them a bit of a poke. There are some students that, that just need that extra little kind of push to have a test. Or if you know there's a problem, I can talk to them and say, look, you know, is there a word on here that you're really having trouble with? Is there something I can do to help you to, to pass these lists? Uh, so if I look at the, the first row there, you can see that that kid doesn't have any blue. So that tells me in week one, they didn't pass a list, but then they have two greens. So that means they would have passed two lists in the second week. Now, if you're really observant, you'll notice that some of the numbers in the first few columns aren't in chronological order. So the first student there has list 22, list 26, list 41, list 44, then they continue on chronological. That's because of something I do called repeat lists. And I'll talk about that in a few slides time. But for the most part, the kids are doing them in order. They don't just get to go to whichever list they want. They do have to pass one after the other. So now we get to term tests. And I feel like this is the missing link in most people's spelling programs because kids are learning the words. They're doing a test. And if you're doing it my way, then you're doing you know, 10 out of 10 as a pass. But then there needs to be some more follow through than that because you need to assess whether the kids have moved it to their short term memory or whether they've actually got it in their long term memory. So if you're one of those teachers that is often noticing that in your kids writing, they're spelling the word wrong that they had a couple of weeks ago in spelling, it means they put it into their short term memory and they didn't commit it to their long term memory. So I do a test either at the end of each term or the beginning of each term, depending on their age, and I test them on all the lists that they should uh, that they have passed in that term. So for younger kids, I do the test at the end of term. For older kids, I give them the two week holiday to, to really make sure that that it's committed to their long-term memory and it's not still in that short-term memory. Uh, so I, I test them at the beginning of the term. So with our younger kids, what that looks like is they are being tested on the closest 10 lists to the ones that they have passed. So let's say a kid started on this five and they finished the term on this nine. I'd be testing them on all the words from this one to 10. Uh, it's always the closest 10, so it's it, I wouldn't test them on five to, to 15. Uh, it just makes it easier to have a group of kids who are all on the same thing. So you, when you're testing all these words, because you're testing hundreds of words per student, you want them in clusters and you want a whole heap of kids on the same words. Uh, with older kids, though, I do it slightly differently. I do it on the hardest one or two words from every list that they have passed. So let me show you the formula for the younger kids. So this is what I give to the younger kids so they know exactly which words they're doing. So I can say, okay, your first word is, your second word is, and they can keep a track of if they've skipped any words. And you can see at the top there that says, that says list 11 to 20. Uh, again, to get uh, a pass, they have to get 10 out of 10. If they don't get a 10 out of 10, I make them go back and I make them repeat the words uh, at the start of the next term. With older kids, um, they have to repeat any list where they got a word wrong. So if I'm testing the older kids on one or two words from every single list, the hardest words, they have to get 100% because they're, they're only being tested on one, maybe two words on each list. So um, they repeat any that they get wrong. So that was a lot to take in. Let's do a recap. I use high frequency word lists. So the most used words in the English language, I've broken them up into lists of 10. So I have list one to list 120 that the kids are working through. I pre-test them to work out which list they're gonna start at. So I'm not making them learn words they already know. I'm not wasting any time. Then in a daily spelling lesson, they are doing look, cover, write, check, followed by an activity that I've chosen and then either going on to free time or some more activities. Uh, the kids get to choose whenever they want to have a test. So while I'm testing those kids, the rest of the kids are doing look, cover, write, check and the activity, the usual procedure. And I train my kids to be silent while I'm testing. Uh, and that's something you can train really quickly. Uh, it takes a couple of weeks to make sure that, you know, you're, you're rewarding the kids who are being silent and you're really watching the rest of the class. And then eventually you don't have to worry about the rest of the class and you can just focus on those students that you're testing. So as soon as they finish testing, if they pass, they get to go and do a pick collage and then they continue on with the usual look, cover, write, check and then an activity. If they don't pass, they're going back to their desk and using that same test to do, sorry, that same list to do look, cover, write, check or um, and then go on to the activity. So I'm expecting them to pass at least one list every two weeks. I feel like even for the weaker students, this is the minimum. 
So if the kids are really struggling to achieve that, I might bring in their parents and have a meeting with them and just say, you know, they're really struggling with spelling. I think they need some extra help. Uh, I might send home the spelling grid as an option to help them at home to give them more time to learn the list. Maybe they just need more time on that list, but I don't want to drag it out with weeks at school. I'd rather they do that time at home. Uh, mnemonics is a great one for weaker students. I, if there's ever a student who comes up to me and you know, three days in a row they've got the same word wrong, I'm going to give them the mnemonic to help them. So a great one that I love is for said, soak ants in dessert. That was one that a kid made up um, quite a few years ago now in my spelling program. And it's stuck in their head and they could spell said every time they remember that. Uh, we've all got our little mnemonics that we've used at some point in our lives, like Wednesday, Wednesday. Uh, February, Feb, are you wary? Just something that's going to help you remember that word. And if you can get the kids to make it up themselves. So last year I had a kid who struggled with the word put, kept putting an O in there. So we made up the mnemonic together, pandas unblocked toilets. So I sat there and said, okay, let's think of an animal first. What's an animal you really love? And he said, pandas. And I said, okay, well, what's something funny that they could be doing? And so we just worked through it like that. Uh, also really analyze what are they getting wrong? What what problems are they having? Why aren't they passing these lists? Uh, a student of mine who's uh, weak at the moment uh, couldn't pass any lists that had digraph sounds on them. They just could not do digraphs and it was it related to an oral speech problem that they have. So we started doing some speech work with them and I um, was lucky enough to have an EA that I could send them out with the EA to do things with. Uh, you might also need to do an IP, IEP, sorry. So once you've picked up what they can't do and what's going wrong, writing up a plan for them to help them get through because obviously they're not being able to keep up with the rest of the class, so they need their own plan. So then with extension, this program already really covers a lot of it. You know, because the kids are on whatever list level they need to be at, they're already being challenged at their own level. So with the uh, more able kids, what you'll notice is they actually start, start to get a bit competitive because they want to be on the top list. And so they're going to push and strive to be to be achieving really, really high. But what I do plan to do is once I get a kid who has passed all 120 lists, I haven't had that happen yet. I'm in year four or five this year and my top student is on list 99. So it's going to happen soon, but it hasn't happened yet. My plan is to move them on to our vocabulary words that we do each week. So within my class, uh, each week is a new vocabulary list. It's 25 words that we go through. I read them and the students repeat them. We read them together. We read them in funny voices. We do activities on them. We try and uh, see if um, they're in any of the stuff that we're reading that week. And so there's a whole heap of different topics that we do vocabulary words on. And my plan is to have the children that pass all 120 lists pick uh, 10 to be their spelling words for that week. And I feel like that would just be a great inter integration because they're already doing it in vocabulary. Bringing it into spelling is just another way that they're going to learn these words and they're going to get stuck in their head um, a bit better than just doing them in vocabulary alone. So I have all these packs in my store. I have a year's worth of vocabulary uh, stuff. So I have a lower and an upper list in every single pack. And that just allows for a bit of differentiation. So in my year one to threes class, I would use my lower list. With my year fours and up, I would use the upper list just to really make sure that the vocabulary words aren't words that they have really heard before or used before. Often they've heard them before, but they can't really define them or use them because they don't really understand what they mean. So let's uh, round up our whole um, program here. And who is this spelling approach really good for? Well, I've heard a lot of great feedback from multi-age group teachers who use this because they can go into a classroom where they have year ones to year fives and they can give out this spelling program and the kids can just be wherever they're at and it works and it works well and they don't have to worry about um, catering for diversity. Uh, it works well for classroom teachers. You know, this is a great program where you set it up once, you spend a bit of time laminating the look cover right check sheets, and then your only commitment each week is to do the tests. There, there's nothing else. You're not constantly photocopying new sheets. You're not trying to um, constantly check over work. It, it's done and it's dusted. So my set that I've got at the moment, my laminated cards, I've been using them for about the last four years because my original list word list changed. So my school gave me a word list and said, you know, we want you to use this one instead. So I had to redo all of my resources to the new list. Uh, but yeah, they've been going on for four years now. They last really, really well. Time and time again, the kids can use them and I don't have to do anything my spelling. My spelling program is always set up at the beginning of the year. It's good to go. And it's just one less thing I have to plan for every single week. This approach is also really good for homeschooling parents. 
Uh, you might not necessarily, you know, laminate all the sheets and print all the stuff off, but you could uh, just write it down or just print them off a um, master copy. You know, it's really, really easy for homeschooling parents to use as well. So in case you're curious, I actually have uh, a lot of these resources that I've shown you today in my store. So you can go and get just the word list if you just want to look, cover, write check sheets. Uh, I've got spelling activities. Uh, the posters are actually a freebie in my store if you want to go check that out. I have the activity sheets, the grids and the role and the right activities. And these are also all found in my complete spelling program where you can get everything all ready to go. So. So thank you so much for listening through all of this today. I hope you found it useful. Uh, if not for a whole program for your classroom, maybe you found some little tidbits you can take back to really maximize and make your own spelling program more efficient. Uh, I really stick by my spelling program. I've been using it for almost a decade now and I've seen really, really good results from the kids and from all kids, you know, not just your, your um, middle of the line kids, but your extension kids and your lower kids, they all benefit from the spelling program. You see it within their writing that these words are sticking. A couple of years ago, I had this opportunity where these year ones that I had taught, I actually had them back as year threes. And so it was really, really good to see how my spelling program had influenced them and uh, whether those words that they had learnt in year one had stuck to year three. And what I found looking at back at my old records from when they were year ones was that the words that they had learnt in term one, two and three had really stuck. Those words didn't go anywhere. The words that they had learnt in term four weren't as good because obviously I didn't get the chance to do the end of term testing and then give them those repeat lists again. But you could really see that if you adopted this program as a whole school, you could get these words, these 1,200 words uh, learnt, you know, maybe from what grade one to grade three. And once they have them locked in, then start going to, to the rest of the words and expanding the vocabulary and doing those sorts of things. So um, just a reminder that you can get an attendance certificate today. It will be in the description down the bottom. Make sure you go and get that for your records. And if you have any questions, feel free to pop them in the comments below or send me an email. I'd love to hear from you. Thank you and goodbye.